Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're enjoying day one of the 2019 MIT Better Sloan Sports there. Analytics Conference. Right, yeah, she, my name is Sam Fetter, and I'm a second year MBA student here at MIT Sloan. And it's my pleasure to introduce this panel, The Cutting Edge Hockey Analytics, presented by SportLogic. Your panelist from closest to me, Sunny Mehta, is former director of hockey analytics with the New Jersey Devils. Bill Zito is the associate general manager of the Columbus Blue Jackets. Christopher Boucher is VP Sports Development, Analytics, and Operations with Sports Logic. And Megan Duggan is a three time Olympic medalist and captain of the US national women's ice hockey team. The panel will be moderated by Tyler Dello, senior analyst with The Athletic. The panel will run about 45 minutes, with 10 minutes at the end dedicated to QA. We encourage you to participate in QA, and to do so, just tweet your question using the hashtag Hockey Analytics. With that, I'll turn it over to Tyler. Thanks, Sam, and thanks to uh, Sloan for organizing this and inviting all of us here today. Uh, the hot topic right now in hockey analytics is tracking data, which is coming finally uh, a decade after the NBA's had it. Chris, your company's already gotten into this area. Mm -hmm. um, how ready do you think teams are to start dealing with this? Teams are preparing. Teams have actually hired people. They're actually bringing people on board to actually be able to process the data and understand the data. The issue they're having right now is just being able to see the data and have the data in front of them. And that's kind of what the, what the main issue that teams are experiencing right now. So do you think that like a majority of the league is... I wouldn't say a majority, but there are definitely teams that are preparing in advance. They've, had, they've hired people, they've put people in place and are just trying to prepare themselves for that data. So does that put the teams then that haven't done that, are they going to be significantly behind once this comes online? When it comes online, if they're not prepared in advance, they will be behind. They'll be, because there's going to be a learning curve, obviously. It's a lot of data, a lot of information. Uh, it's going to be ne uh, difficult necessarily to understand where one, where, because it's eventing and tracking data, right? So where does one end, when, where does one begin? Where are the gaps between the two? Those are where the questions are going to are gonna be. And the teams that are in a, a little bit ahead of the game in terms of that, they'll be able to definitely have an advantage, I think so. Sonny, you've, pra you've uh, practiced this area, you've worked in this area for a long time, and you've been around this area for a long time, like going back to the mid-2000s. What's your sense about how prepared the league is to start integrating data like this? Uh, <laughs> maybe a little less bullish than, than Chris's, you know. Uh, I think there are definitely a couple teams that are very well prepared for it. Um, I think there are quite a few teams that are not. And, um, you know, like you, I'm sure I'm personally really excited about that data and the opportunity that it, that it brings, but, um, you know, it's... I think the advent of data like that will have the effect of increasing variance in terms of the things that people can do with it. It's not necessarily clear to me that it's going to increase the expected value, you know, in the sense that good analysis is still good analysis. You know, the data doesn't necessarily make the analysis. Um, so if you're doing good analysis, I think having more data will obviously be a benefit. But if you're not doing good analysis, it's not going to help you, and in fact, if anything, it might hurt you. you know? Where do you see the opportunities with this data in terms of doing good analysis? Like, how do you think it's going to most impact? Coaching or management? Or is there, is there an area where you think that there's kind of easy gains to be had fairly quickly? I do. Um, Please tell us. Uh, <laughs> maybe not specifically, <laughs> but uh, I think it can help in all of those. Yeah. You know? I mean, don't, you know, I think coaching and player acquisition, you know, pretty much across the board. I think it can help, you know? I mean, if you're, if you're looking at what's happening on the ice in the right way, how can it not help in every facet of that? You know? Right. I think more specifically, it's going gonna, it's gonna to aid in the gap. There's always a gap, right? There's a gap between eventing and with uh, player tracking. And what you're going to be able to find here is you're going to be able to lead in, you're going to be able to fill those gaps. So Chris, uh, the only way to fill those gaps is if you have both of them integrated together. You've, you've used two words here. I think it's eventing yeah. is the one, yeah. and then the other is player tracking. So eventing is, Can you explain what you so mean? So event data is a pass, a shot, a, a stick check. Right? Okay. That's the event. And right. then you have the player tracking, which is where they are on the ice, how fast they're moving, and where, where the puck is. Right? That works in three, uh, three on three when you have a video and you're able to see the tracking, you're able to integrate the, both of them in, into a video and you see it. It works really well. But if you have a, a battle along the half wall where a defenseman pinched in, and you just have the puck and you have the player tracking, and there's four players around the puck and the puck exits the D zone, Would, you don't really get any information. There's a gap there, unless you know what happened. So there's a gap in terms of there's no event being recorded. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And Once you integrate those two things together, which I think that's where the power will come. Okay. In terms of filling in the gaps. Yeah. 
because uh, right now the gap with eventing data is that you don't have everybody on the ice. It's situational stuff, right? Con contextual. Right. Let's say you're a power play. If you're going, if you're doing a scene pass, where's the box? Where's the box situation? How tight is the box? How big is the box? Uh, is there even a lane available? Is the, is there a scene pass available? Uh, that's what you have now as a gap, right? There's no information on that. That's what you get with eventing. If you track, had the tracking and the eventing together, you put those two things together seamlessly. Okay, so the eventing is basically a listing of what happened, and what yep. you're saying is that what the tracking data is going to add in is the capacity to kind of understand the context in yep. which that event All happened. All contextual, yeah. And to fill in the blank yep. spots that the eventing data, yep. and is that something that Sport Logic is that something, an area you guys have gotten yeah, into? Yeah, we're working on it, and we've been working with that, that, yeah. that type of data, and we're definitely, uh, I feel, ahead of the game in terms of being able to integrate those two things together. And. And, and so it, are, are you guys at the point where you're sort of able to track stuff, like how tightly is a box packed on a yeah. penalty kill? And Yeah, our, our system can do that, absolutely. And really, and, and is that information right now that's being made available to, to NHL teams? Not to NHL teams at this point. Okay, but it's something you guys are, yeah. are working on. Yeah. Bill, you've been in, in the, you know, the area now, first as an agent and then subsequently as an associate general manager for, uh, gosh, uh, 20, 30 year, tw 20 years, uh, since 96. It's aging. <laughs> <laughs> How have you seen things change as the data's come online, and where do you see the impacts in your day-to-day -day business? Well, listening to you, it, it's funny to hear, you know, obviously there's going to be an impact now as we go from the event-based data into the tracking data, right? And knowing and understanding the rates of speed, right, that's easy. But the exciting part for me is going to be the layers of the stuff we don't know. Right. What are we going to glean? What information is yeah. going to come our way that somebody's going to say, what about this? Can we track that? Yeah. Um, what does that mean? Where can we go? What's the next step? And that's something that I think you're going to find a lot of teams focusing on. Um, uh, it, it's been very interesting to watch over 20 years the baseball model yeah. and then creep into hockey and people try to push away the analytics, if you will, right? And then other people figuring out, well, it is really just common sense, yeah. right? And, and it, it, it's just another way to look at things. So I, I, I can appreciate you're probably very frustrated on some levels. And, and I get <laughs> a little bit more excited because I'm, I don't have your, your acumen for the, for the numbers, but I, I'm pretty bullish on the, I'm very excited yeah. about the opportunity to, to bring this new data package in and, and learn from it. Yeah, and within your team, like uh, you guys are a team that I've always understood is fairly progressive. Like this is something that Columbus has pursued over the years, looking for edges there. Is that fair? Yeah, I think it is fair. And we've got a couple of guys on our staff that work really hard at it full time, uh, Josh Flynn and Tom Bark, and they, um, and it's a, it's a really, I think, healthy, open dialogue. Right. And, and everybody contributes and reads and is interested and listens. And um. Yeah, well, that's excellent. Megan, you have a unique perspective up here because you actually played the game <laughs> uh, at, a, at a respectable level. Uh, as a player, do you see, are there things that interest you or things that you think would help you perform better that uh, you know, the new data that's coming online could help with? Definitely. I mean, I think as a player, I see this in two different ways. Right. Um, you know, on, on the one hand, where there's a lack of buy-in from players or coaches or things like that, um, I can see because there's, there's so much about all sports, but hockey uh, specifically, obviously, being in that field, there's, there's something so magical about just having to play the game, about not, um, you know, knowing every single little thing and just the magic of sports. Crazy things happen all the time for reasons that nobody can explain. Um, and I love that about sports. I love that about hockey. Um, so that's the side where I can see, you know, players, coaches would be hesitant. It's new. Um, it controls a lot of the game. Um, but on the flip side of that, um, I'm the type of athlete, I've always been the type of athlete that if there's a way that I can be better this much, I want to know. Right. Um, and I want to be able to work at that. And I, I imagine there's tons of players in the NHL um, that feel that way. There's got to be players on the, you know, on the flip side of that that they don't want to know. They don't want to be told, you know, you need to be faster, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Or, you know, even from a, a standpoint of, um, you know, certain, certain wearables that players wear that detect, you know, recovery timelines and things like that. As a player, I never want to be told, you know, you need to take a day off. Right. Things like that based on the data. Right. Um, you know, you're, you're built to just, I want to power through, I want to play, but 
you know, from a longevity standpoint, taking those days off and knowing that and seeing the data is probably helpful. So I guess I can see both sides. I can see where the pushback can come from right. and why players, you know, don't want all of it implemented. But on the flip side, I mean, there's players and you would want players on your team as well that want to be the best athlete they can be, you know, find all those small advantages, find that 1% everywhere so you can have the best team, you know, the best franchise, things like that. Now, you mentioned something interesting to me. So your, your career, you started university, or I say university, I think you guys say college down here. Same thing. Uh, you started college <laughs> in 2006, is yep. that right? And so your career is kind of straddled two eras in terms of wearables. Like when you started out, um, I think there was much less focus on that and much less focus on using technology to train and to improve your fitness. Are there ways that, you know, and so I guess, I guess the first question is, having been on both sides of that era, have, have you felt like you've benefited from kind of having access to that technology and that information? 100%. I mean, again, as I mentioned, um, I'm, I'm the type of athlete, I want to know that information. I want to digest it, want to be better any way you can, even if someone's going to tell me you were terrible today or you were terrible, you know, multiple games in a row. Um, but yeah, when I was in college, my first couple years at the University of Wisconsin, I think it was my second or third year, our strength coach and our coach got together and they implemented you know, a certain wearable system that we used. Um, and it, it was totally new to me, it yeah. seemed like. I had never as an athlete worn even a heart rate monitor strap. And this was that to the nth degree. And they were able to, um, you know, like I said, put into a, a recovery protocol. Some players are obviously expand, expending more energy than others during games and practices. And, treating each athlete different as all athletes are different. Right. Um, so that was, it was pretty great. And I, I enjoyed learning about it. I enjoyed kind of being a test subject for our strength coach and, um, and our head coach there. Um, and that was my introduction to it. So I've, you know, on teams I've been a part of and even personally in my own individual training have used different wearable devices um, throughout the last 10 years, I would say, and definitely um, benefit from them. And is there anything in particular that you think helps sell it to the athlete? Like, is it being able to show some results <clears throat> from doing things a certain way? Like, what convinced you that, you know, okay, this is right, like using data or incorporating it is better than just going on, on feel? I think that what convinced me was, um, you know, as an athlete prior to any wearable or having any of this knowledge, um, you know, you have days throughout your training cycles where you just, you, you feel awful and you don't know why, you know, physically. You're just, you know, things aren't on. Um, you know, your body feels terrible and, and you don't really know why. You, maybe you did get rest, you felt like you got rest a couple days before and things like that. Um, so for me, you know, I actually started using um, Omega Wave system to really help me with um, recovery. And yeah. days that I would wake up and I, you know, I would think, man, I'm ready to go. And the, the system was saying, absolutely not. Today is a day you need to do X, Y, and Z from a recovery standpoint. Um, you know, it was really measuring things that I couldn't measure on my own or couldn't take a good look at myself and say, you know, these types of areas in my body or these types of loads are not going to be great for me long term today. Um, so that was something that, you know, I saw, felt firsthand, felt that it really helped me um, and I was able to improve in different areas and feel better on certain days and have less, you know, terrible days where you just felt burnt out. Um, so that was kind of a buy in for me. See, that's really interesting to me because what it kind of suggests to me is, you know, and again, I'm looking at this from the perspective of somebody dealing with data and then dealing with consumers of it, whether it's you or a coaching staff or a management group, you as an athlete. Um, and it's almost like you want to try and find some wins in the sense of, look, we did this and it worked to build the relationship and the trust between the... Uh, the data and then being able to get certain results. Is that is that fair to say? Absolutely. I mean, I would say if you're able to show athletes this this is the data, this is how you've improved or the system will help you improve. Yeah. Um, you know, mentally strong athletes want want that information and they want to be better. Professional athletes want that information because they want to be better. And um, you know, for me, those would be the athletes I would want as part of my team and my culture if I was, you know, a coach or a general manager or something like that, I would yeah. say. Chris, what have you found? Like in your in your work with Sport Logic, you're dealing directly with NHL yep. teams. How are you able to sort of achieve buy-in from them when it comes to dealing with data? The key is really is the terminology and the language. Being able to translate the data into something that's hockey language, right? Uh, rather than talking about something something abstract, really focus on things that teams want to know about, whether it be regroups or transition game or a forecheck forechecking system. Uh, how far is F2 from F1? Once you're using the proper terms, there's buy-in and there's an understanding, and then you can start talking the same language. 
Okay, so from your perspective, it really is a language issue. Yeah, absolutely. Sonny, that's something you've dealt with. What's, what's, your, what's your sense of the best way to go about accomplishing that? You know, I, I, I really agree with like everything Megan was just saying. Like my experience, and I know Tyler, you kind of, you know, were in a similar situation where you kind of go into this role thinking of that scene in Moneyball where, you know, it's gonna be everybody versus, for, versus the analytics guy, and it just really was not my experience. You know, I think particularly with the players and particularly like the, the coaches and the scouts, but like specifically the, the people that are on the ice, at ice level every day. Um, I was overwhelmed at times with like how curious and interested all these people were. Um, you know, almost every player when they were, you know, up in the booth because they were nursing an injury or not playing that night or whatever. I mean, they would always kind of like find their way over to me and just be curious, like, well, what are you, what are you working on? What are you doing? You know, like, can you, can you help me? Yeah. And I mean, why wouldn't they, right? Yeah. I mean, these are competitive people. They're all in this to win. They, they've been in hockey their whole lives. Like anything that can give them an edge, of course they're interested. Like they're just, they're fascinated by hockey. They're passionate about hockey. Um, so that was, that was largely my experience. And I, you know, I think you had a similar yeah, no, that's, uh, that's you know, I, I would agree. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of people here who, you know, might someday aspire to be in a role like that. What, if, if you were sort of advising them on how to, you know, get that buy-in from coaches or management or players, is there, is there anything specific that comes to mind for you? Like, for me, it's, you know, finding a way to give them information that they don't already know that is, you know, ends up being accurate and reliable. Um, but it's kind of a, like, I really think of it as a process of looking for wins, like looking for things where they go, okay, this person, I don't know them, but they're giving me information that is useful and that I trust and that I'm comfortable with. Is that, is that your sense? Yeah. I mean, I guess even to what Chris just said, I think the, the language you use um, is important. I, you know, I think it even starts before that. I yeah. think, to be honest, like the analysts themselves, the analysts themselves, need to understand their own models. They need to understand their own math. They have to understand it at an intuitive level. It's not just about, you know, writing some R function and throwing a big regression out there and saying like, look, this is, this is what it just came out with and I have no idea why, but you should listen to me. Yeah. That's not gonna work, you know? But understanding your math and understanding, uh, being able to explain it, even yeah. if not, you know, the nuts and, uh, you know, not at a detailed level, like you don't need to explain what an R squared is or, I mean, maybe yeah. you do, but what, you know, just being able to understand it yourself is the first step. And then I think on top of that, then, you know, using the, the sort of translation language or the, the, the words that are going to translate it into a way that the players and the coaches and the management are going to understand is it's important. And I think, you know, just like teaching anything else, it's, you know, using a lot of examples and not talking down to people and all. I mean, common sense sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. And Bill, I guess you've seen this from the other side, given that you're in management, you guys have analysts. As someone receiving this information, as opposed to creating it and disseminating it, what makes it work for you? Like, what, what do you want to see when it comes to what people are giving you in terms of helping you make a decision? Well, the communication's key. So yeah. I mean, that's... that's 90% of the equation in most instances. And a lot of times there's a seminal moment where some bit of information will flow to the player and it'll work. Yeah. And they'll understand, ah, oh, I get it. And then in other situations, there'll, there'll be, you know, for example, you know, puck possession through the neutral zone over the offensive blue line. Yeah. Well, what if I'm not good? <laughs> right? I, and the coach is, I can't. I'd love to possess it over the blue line every time. I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. And the coach is screaming at me. So I could try. Because Sonny tells me, you want to skate it over the blue line every time. That's we're going to win. No, we're not. We're going to lose because I'm going to turn it over and the coach is going to scrape, right? Yeah. So you have to balance it. But if you explain what you're getting at and why, and you're able to convey why it's important, right. I think that makes a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really just interpersonal skills, getting people to understand that everyone's in it together to try to win. And... Uh, collectively coming together to, to utilize the to utilize this this powerful resource and tool right. that's really not just unique to sport remember all you know in, in our medicine and science yeah. all, it, this is it's not a secret right works everywhere else in our lives but this is now a mystery here yeah no. yeah and it's interesting right like you brought up communication and I think that's a constant whatever industry you're in 
Um, if you can't communicate your ideas to other people, you're kind of wasting your time and you're probably wasting theirs because they're sitting there listening to someone they don't understand. Well, it can't be that stat-based uh, stat results are right. applicable throughout our world, right? And now in sport, maybe they're not because we don't communicate them properly? Right. Uh, just, no. Right. No, I think that's a real important truth Like for what people should take away is the better you are at communicating, the better you'll be at doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, do, are, you, are you guys sport, sport logic? Do you have your own internal expected goals uh, we do. model? And, and what do you, like it's, you know, I've seen some of the public ones and what I've taken away from them is it troubles me that there's a lack of information about how the puck is moving before the shot. And I know with some of the soccer ones, they get really advanced and they're taking into account where defenders are on the pitch. What do you think, like, in terms of where hockey's at? Um, I guess the first question is, you know, you guys have developed a private model. Do you find that it's significantly different than what we see from the public ones that are built on weaker data? It is, and it is because we have the information. that We have the pre-shot movement information. We know whether it's a two-on-one or whether it's a breakaway or whether it's a three-on-one. We know the pre-shot movement. Pre-shot movement is huge, right? If it's a seam play on a power play, it definitely has a higher value. If you're just looking at location, you're not going to get the same information on a rebound. If the rebound is from a shot from here and it's over here, but over here for the rebound, the shots from there, obviously that's going to have a lot more value than just and then just having the shot information without that information. And then there's a temporal factor that you can add in as well. One timers. There's a lot of stuff that we can do uh, that we get, we can use, integrate the data into that and create a model that's a lot stronger. Absolutely. And so, have you done stuff like contrasting a sport logic model with you know maybe one of the public models that's yeah well, yeah we, we've yeah we've done that yeah and and do you see like teams like and I'll just pick one at random but say like the L.A. Kings of mm -hmm. their heyday. Yeah. You know, every year there would be expected goals models that love them. LA would shoot 5% and they'd struggle to score goals. So with, with the data that you guys are dealing with, um, w would you see something significantly different with a team that plays like that? Absolutely. And you, you, what you'll see is you'll see shot location, obviously, but you also see the pre-shot movement. Right. Those, 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 those east-west passes below the, below the, below the face-off dots are huge in it. And that's what you see. You see teams that uh, you see their expected goal, uh, their expected goal numbers online, and you see that they're they're doing really well, but they're not able to score. And when we start looking at the data, we see that those are the teams that just aren't making those plays, aren't creating that offense. Right, Sonny, What do you think is going to be like a first step? So we get this new data online. What's the first step for a team that wants to make good use of it? And when I say online, I mean like available. I don't think it'll actually be online for random people. <laughs> but um, you know, like like so, you're a team. You've got a department. This new data becomes available. What to you is the first step to kind of taking advantage of it? Uh, hire good people. You yeah. Know? That's step one. Right. Um, assuming you have good people in place, provide them with the necessary infrastructure. You know, that's other talented people, a budget for other talented people, and uh, good infrastructure for data, whether that's, you know, cloud servers or, you know, it's fast computers, um, standard stuff. Yeah. You know, in in terms of that, from the team's perspective, I think. And then in terms of actually dealing with the data, like it, you know, what what would be the first thing you'd get into if you were uh, if you were doing this? Um, you know, to me, everything comes down to predictive value. Right. And um, it's no different, no matter what data I'm using. You know, right. you're trying to understand this thing that's happening on the ice. You're trying to understand the sport better and learn some truth about it. Right. And to me, the way that should manifest itself is you being better at knowing what's going to happen uh, than average. Uh, and it's, it's really no more complicated than that. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, everything from the top down. Well, that's... Uh that covers everything, comprehensive. <laughs> Megan, Mike. we've talked a bit about, you know, as a player, um, you know, what, what, what kind of preparation goes into games. And I, I know for a lot of people who aren't in pro hockey, they probably don't have any idea in terms of how, how you guys are preparing for a game. So, so let's talk about, you know, Team USA, you're playing, say, a series against Canada. Um, what's a game day like? What kind of preparation is there for you? Um, for us, actually, over the last, I would say, you know, with the national team, um, it, for the last 12 years I've been on the team, for instance, kind of depends a little bit on the coach that we have um, and, you know, what their, their styles are. Uh, preparations for us over the years have changed tremendously. Um, and that's actually, 
I think with that being said, that's a, something I would be interested in, you know, the national team having more access to some of the data and analytics and things like that. So you can almost more, more so streamline right. um, the preparation. I think that would help a lot in that area because, like I said, we've been part of teams where, you know, sometimes you have a coach, you watch a handful of different clips on, say, um, you know, your opponent, you watch a handful of different special teams clips and things like that, a lot of video-based stuff, um, and then you're out the door. You're ready for your nap and your pregame meal and, you know, all that, your, your coffee before the game. But I've had coaches where, you know, you, you sit and you watch an entire game um, over afterwards. It takes hours of video or hours of meetings and, and things like that. So um, I think you know, having more access, definitely on the women's side, to um, these specific data analytics and things that you can really get to the numbers and get to the data quickly um, right. and see things easier um, would make a huge difference on the, you know, on the women's side in preparation for, for games. Right, and I think that's probably something that extends across hockey is to the extent you can simplify, like one of the things that really struck me when I went and worked in hockey was um, coaches were focused on having short meetings. And uh, I would say that, you know, there are some coaches who aren't maybe great believers in the attention spans of their players. <laughs> yeah. And to the extent that you could focus the information, and it sounds to me like you, you agree with this, to, to the extent that you can use the data to focus the information and the preparation, yeah. you're, you know, as a player, that, that's certainly something that, that resonated with you. Absolutely. I, think, I mean, I think that would be huge to be able right. to consolidate, um, you know, your, your game prep time because player, players are crazy, right? They have their own routines and yeah. superstitions and things like that. So being able to consolidate and simplify anything for a player on game day yeah. um, or even, you know, in, in the days leading up as they're preparing for um, a game in a couple of days, I think that would be huge and, and game changing. Bill, as someone who works in management and as someone who's been on the, you know, I guess you've been on the agent side for, for many years, um, there's been a bit of a resistance, or there's a, at least a perception, I think it's more than a perception, I think it's been reported, that, you know, the players are uncomfortable with data coming into the game. Um, given your background as an agent, like, uh, do you see some real concerns for them there, or, or do you think that these are issues that can be dealt with with education? Um, how do you think that could be managed for the league as things go along? I have to be careful. With yes, my no, words. I, know, I, know. Um, I, I think this is a personal statement. Yep. So I think that there's some concerns from the seniority viewpoint of the union where perhaps an older player slowing down may have concerns that he would be pushed out and a younger, faster player may be coming in. Right. In a CBA that is a 50-50 revenue split, I think the membership may be more concerned with the highest quality product that they could get, the best athletes they could put on the ice, right. and may sacrifice the older, the older players. So that's maybe an internal, an internal discussion that they could have. Um, even, even things as simple as heart rate monitors on the bench, right? Yep. So you talked about your recovery. You don't want to be told you have a day off. What if you have a one goal lead and you're, you're time out, and you're going back on, and your teammate isn't recovered. Do you want her going out? Or do you want your coach to have the ability? Now, if it's you, you may, oh, I can do it, I can do it. Yeah, exactly. But, but, but that's, don't that's you want it? And, and mm -hmm. the, the, the scientists have told you, mm-mm, right? Mm -hmm. So for, you have two years of data that says, if you don't get your heart below whatever the threshold is, right, don't go, because you're not going to be at peak performance, it's a big game. Right. So do we want that data? Do we, are we going to exclude people? I, I don't know. I can appreciate from the, from the player's standpoint, you know, the concerns. And you don't want to artificially exclude people. And you don't want, but I think that there's a, re, I mean, there's enough data already that, that we just want to get better. And we yeah. just want to improve. And we want to use all these available resources. And I think the players, the most of the players share that sentiment. Yeah. I think they're excited about this. They're enthusiastic about getting the data. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about younger players buying in too much. Can you imagine that as the cost point of this technology decreases and now a 16-year-old gets tracked at a 28 miles an hour yeah. and now all of a sudden he's the rocket yeah, yeah. and he can't play, but he's the rocket mm -hmm. and then the scholarship never comes, but I'm the rocket. Yeah. 
and everybody in his in his high school or his junior, but he's the rocket. Yeah. You know, well, you know, I can you can see, but it's probably no different than I'm sure that there's a similar data point now that, that people rely on artificially and create problems, but sure, um, sure, sure, because people will look now at you know some like actually it's funny I remember watching a documentary this is like 20 years ago and there's an agent yelling at uh, an AGM on the phone and he's trying to sell penalty minutes he's like you know my guy is 200 penalty minutes where are you going to get your penalty minutes and you know in, <laughs> in retrospect buying penalty minutes may not be an efficient use of cash um, but. Uh, you know, it was, you know, to your point, Bill, about the concern about bad metrics or, you know, influencing decisions improperly, I think, is, is a real one for players. And that's, um, and, and even about players, particularly young players. Like, this is something that I've found interesting talking to people in the game, is they talk about a divide between older players and younger players, and younger players and people in general being much more comfortable with data and much more comfortable with having their performance, you know, ripped apart like that or, or tracked. And so I do think that you're, you've got a strong point there, that there's probably something um, that we'll have to be kept an eye on in terms of you know, how you deal with these two different classes of players who may have different concerns and issues about the, the data. I think too, sorry, as no, you mentioned, ahead, the, um, it, we've talked about it already, but I think the communication standpoint with players is, is so huge. You mentioned it, you mentioned mm -hmm. it. Um, I just think to an experience our team had, yeah, you know, we're at the Olympics last year, we've prepared ultimately our entire lives for this. We show up in our jerseys, we found, you know, we hadn't been asked, hadn't been talked to about it or anything. There was these tracking devices in our jerseys that collected all sorts of data that they showed, I think mainly for the fans. Right. Um, but it was something that, you know, we had discussions about as players in the locker room. We, we knew nothing about it. You know, as an athlete, you go to the Olympics, you're so particular about, you know, the type of tape you use on your shin pads, let alone a device now about this big that you can feel sewn into your jersey in the back of your... Um, you know, right behind your head here. So uh, it threw us all off, not, not totally, but there were conversations about it. And I think the communication standpoint is huge. We were wondering, you know, why are they in there? Is this data gonna help us in this tournament or is it just for the fans? Um, and there was, a, you know, there was no communication, not a huge deal, but I think just an example of the importance of communication with players um, in, you know, new technology, new devices, and new tracking. And, how, and then how do we use it? I'll tell you a quick story briefly. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And, and uh, during the last lockout, actually Adam Burrish and I, we had a charity hockey game in Chicago. And uh, we had, it ended up being the, the Blackhawks Stanley Cup team against Team World. And it was kind of a fun friendship game. And it was well attended. It was for Ronald McDonald House. And, the score was like 11 to 9 with five minutes to go. And uh, I happened to be on one of the benches and uh, walked over to, Burrish was on the Blackhawks team, and I said, listen, we'll let you, the fans were having a great time. I said, we'll let you guys score two goals, so we got to have overtime. This is awesome. And, it, and Jonathan Taves looked at me and said, blank you, Billy. <laughs> we're going to score those two goals. <laughs> And I was taken aback, and Pat Kane looked at me and said, oh, you've never seen that act before, huh? <laughs> and, and it was giggling, and I hadn't. But imagine now if he's the guy whose heart rate is up, and you're the coach. Yeah. Right. You want him on the ice? I do. Now, what if, what if, the, what, now, what are we doing with the data about us? And I'm just using heart rate as an example, right? Who's got that? Is it, is it on TV? Is it on Twitter? Like, where is it? Yeah. So now if the coach says, I'm putting him out, that guy, he's on the ice for me. Hmm. And, and they get scored on. And now everyone in the world is, so, so there's just so many questions and issues to be dealt with as to how we deal with it and, and then the team dynamic and all those things. So it's, yeah. but, but again, <coughs> you, you deal with it. You sort through it. Yeah. It's, it's not a reason to not do it. And was that really, that was the issue for you guys, Megan, is that you weren't sort of told here's what we're doing, here's where it's gonna go, this is why we're doing it. It was just sort of a, oh, there's a lump in the back of your shirt, <laughs> enjoy your three times in a lifetime moment with this new weird change. Is yeah, that... I guess, I mean, I, and again, I, I wouldn't classify it as an issue. It, it wasn't something that we were all like frantically freaking out about, but it was just, I thought it was interesting. And it was something that, you know, there were conversations about it. And at that time when, you know, a huge focus is minimizing distractions, um, in any form, right? Um, it was. I I just found that communication may have eased some of that. Yes, 
Now, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Sonny, I have to ask you because uh, you're doing the rare back-to-back -back panels here. <laughs> What lessons from poker can NHL teams take away to think about doing analytics well? Randomness. Randomness. In a word, yeah. yeah. Just understanding it, understanding the role of chance, understanding, I mean, we talked about this at the poker panel. Um, you know, for me, the way I look at analytics, it's, it's less about statistics as it is about probability. I mean, ultimately, that's what you're, you know, to piggyback on my point before about prediction, it's, and that's what you're after, right? No matter what data you use, you're after coming up with some sort of probabilistic model for decision making. Right. And um, understanding that, just thinking in that way, thinking about it in those terms, I think is, is really helpful because in poker, you're, you're fundamentally taught when you start playing poker at a high level that the way you get better at poker is to focus on the things that you can control. Right. And you know that the result is not gonna track with that 100%. Like, there's a lot of, there's chance involved in the result. So you can get your money in as an 80-20 favorite and lose. You're supposed to lose. The universe demands that you lose 20% of the time. Um, hockey's no different. Right. You know? Hockey, in some ways, there's more luck in hockey. You know, I got my money in, in poker with much better odds than the average hockey team has when they're playing another average hockey team. Right, right, um, right. In the NHL these days, it's, you know, almost every game is, not every game, but the typical game is 55-45, right? Yeah. And so I think it's easy, and it's, it's a necessary step for coaches and management and players and everything to go back and look at everything they did with a microscope and say, what could we do better? But I think it, it's helpful to have the, the big picture in mind that, you know what? There's also some chance involved here. Like, we might have done a lot of things really well, and we lost just because things happen. One of the things that, you know, really stuck with me is that there's really a, a bit of a disconnect or a challenge for coaches because as the coach, you almost need to convince your team that your result every night is absolutely within your control. If you go out and you execute the plan and you do A, B, C, D, we will win. And, and the thing is, is that nobody ever executes their plan perfectly. So you could say to your guys, well, look, we lost because of, you know, these things we didn't do. But, you know, I, I think what your point is, like, there's going to be nights, like, like, to me, this was really a kind of a contradiction for the coaches. There's going to be nights where you lose, um, and yet you, you've done things well enough to win. But, you know, you still have to, you know, as the coach, just saying, well, you know, we could have won. You still want to drill in on the things that, you know, you could have done better. So even though randomness is going to cost you a lot of games, and as a coach, you can intellectually know that, at the same time, you still don't want to be focused on the randomness. Um, like, you don't want to, like, you know, so if a guy lets in a bad goal or whatever, fine. You, you don't want to say, okay, he stinks. But at the same time, you do want to focus on the things that, you know, weren't random in your, perform in your process that could have been better. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I, I, I take your point, and I'm even torn in terms of, like, how much you necessarily need to uh, dwell on that with the players themselves. Right. Because I do agree, like, the coach and the players have a certain responsibility, and it's to play their best at all times and to prepare them to play their best at all times. Right. But I think the process in place can help that, knowing that, right? Because if the coach is fundamentally showing the player some mistake that he made that, you know, we have a lot of sort of evidence for that this is not a repeatable mistake and that um, the player may have actually done something really, really well and just got a bad result. Yeah. I think at that point in time, it could be really helpful for the coach to focus on the right things with the players. I mean, I think coaches do this a lot already. I think, um, yeah, there's kind of like a software in their brains that, that you know, I agree does that, you know, it's maybe 80 or 90% of the way there. Yes. And then there's some times where it kind of goes, you know, bad coach. Because it's whatever. hard. Yeah, I mean, it's no yeah. different than in poker. Like, you know, when you get your money in as an 80-20 favorite and you lose, you're still ticked off you lost yeah like even though you know the the play is to stay cool and not worry about it and just do the exact same thing the next time it's it's a lot easier said than done yeah chris is is tracking data coming for the junior level like is it is it going to be involved in prospect evaluation i think so i think it's just a question of time I yeah really, that, what that time frame is i really can't tell you but it's definitely will come and is that something that you guys are doing now, is developing or generating sort of higher, higher level data for, for junior prospects? Yes, yeah, not necessarily the full tracking scheme, but yes, we are generating that, that type of data for junior. 
And Bill, as somebody who is in the management room and trying to draft better, and I think you guys have done pretty well over the years, you've had certainly some, some big hits that were you know, high profile. Well, you guys drafted Pierre-Luc Dubois a few years ago, and that was a high profile case where that ran counter to what I think the public perception was. Do you find that you know, data is able to help you when you're doing, at, at this point, is data able to inform any of your drafting, or do you think it's still not quite there yet in terms of what's available? Oh, to a considerable level, for yeah. sure. Yep, it's um, it, it plays a considerable part in the evaluation process, as well as the assimilation of information in that process. Right. And even the way the, even the way our scouts are trained to think, and uh, it, it 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 plays a, a bigger role than I think people suspect. Oh, really? A, in addition to the traditional sure sort of subjective analysis that we all go through. Yeah. No, my my thought on that has always been like. You want to try and find sort of areas where they agree and then where they disagree, you want to go, okay, well, why do we disagree here and how can we resolve that disagreement? Because if you resolve the disagreement, somebody might learn something, whether it's your scouts will get better, and I think you, you touched on that by saying it informs what you look for, or your analysts can get better because they can learn that, okay, the way we're doing this, there's a better way to do it and, you know, you know we can go from there. And how can you look at things differently? Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, or, and, and, or in two different ways at the same time, right? Yeah. Let's look at it from this perspective and have the same actor look at it from a different perspective and then have that person sort it out and then have the discussion with the other person. Right. You're only going to get a better answer by doing that. And Chris, you've been doing this now with Sport Logic, I think, for about five years. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Do you find that, you know, again, focusing on the prospect analysis, do you think there's more openness now to incorporating data into that work for teams? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And I've been in meetings where this was discussed in terms of just incorporating this in their analysis, actually having the scouts understand the data to the point where the scouts can kind of integrate this into their own scouting reports. Oh, really? Absolutely. Oh, that's, and it, that must be fairly new. That can't be that common. No, that's definitely last off season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's uh, that's quite a change. That's uh, that is something. Sorry, I've just got my question list here. I'm uh, I've lost. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, what's, uh, and this is a bit of a broad question, but I'm curious about tactical inefficiencies on the ice that you think might be, uh, have some, some light shed on them by data. A, a, a common example, pulling the goalie. It's become much more common to pull the goalie uh, earlier and earlier and earlier in the game. Are teams getting that right, do we think? Are teams, um, I guess there's, there's that, are teams getting that right, and I guess, are there any other examples people have of, uh, you know, tactical changes that data might drive in the near future? And I guess, Megan, I'll ask you, because as an athlete, you know, you might have some thoughts about your team making decisions even just based on data like that. Does that bother you? Well, I guess, I mean, kind of to my, my point earlier on, um, there's something about in the moment, um, you know, decisions that coaches or players make on adrenaline, the magic of sport. Um, you know, the goalie pull situation is so interesting to me. I think, I can't remember if it was you and I that talked about it, but, um, you know, years ago when Patrick Waugh pulled the goalie with nine minutes left and everyone thinks that's crazy and, um, you know, but, but why not? You know, why not make a, a rash decision? Sometimes maybe it works out, others it doesn't. But um, I just think, you know, for me to have data control every aspect of the game would be difficult to think about because there, I, I believe so much in... Um, you know, just gut feeling sometimes by right. coaches or players or, you know, you mentioned the, the Jonathan Taze thing and him wanting to go out and what percentage is he at and, and things like that. Um, I believe in kind of, you know, that, that raw, in the moment um, decision making in sport as well. It's interesting because, you know, you know, the women's game obviously isn't the same as the men's game, but one of the ways it isn't the same is that there's kind of, there's kind of a disparity in talent, right? Like when you guys are playing Canada, uh, you know, most of us would say Canada is a little bit better, but uh, <laughs> most of us, I don't know. You might be the lone soldier on that. Okay, mystery. okay, <laughs> tough crowd. But uh, when you guys are playing Canada, it's a fairly evenly matched game, and you know the implications of pulling your goalie there are different than if you're playing a weaker team, like say Finland or something. And if you pull your goalie, you might be able to just completely control play. And so a lot of the research doesn't necessarily, like a lot of the research on pulling the goalie has been done on the NHL specifically. And it may not translate specifically to the women's game or women's game, which I think is a real issue with starting to pull those data conclusions and take them over. Yeah, for sure. And that's, um, I think, 
I, I agree completely. I mean, there's, there's, the game is almost identical, but there are, you know, there's small ways in that it's different. And it would be, you know, we spoke briefly before, but just getting, um, you know, some of this information and the data and um, all that involved in the women's game more, I think, would be a huge plus. Okay. Chris, are there any tactical changes you see that, you know, like, is there something you think is coming? I think, I think where we're going to see the, the, the earliest returns probably is late game player usage. Really? Uh, in terms of, let's say, how many forwards you're going to use what? and whether or not you're going to be choosing to have a defenseman on the ice at all. So that late, player, late, late game player usage, I think, is where we're going to see the first, uh, the first results. So instead of, instead of pulling and going with, say, four forwards and two defensemen, yeah. you, you might go, go with five six forwards? Four or maybe or even with six, depending on what you're doing. I think, I think there's, if, if, if your goal in that situation is to create offense, right. why wouldn't you put on your best offensive And players. is that a question you've looked into? I know that you guys are, in addition to being a data warehouse, you guys are quite the little academic think tank as well. I think you've got like three or four papers here. It's crazy. <laughs> um, it, have you started to see data that you think supports that conclusion? Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. And it's not something I've really, this is, this is really off the top of my head kind of okay. question. Okay. Answer well, answering your first question. So we haven't really done that work yet. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll be interested to see. I know you guys have done some great stuff on face-offs, so I look forward to reading the paper next year Thanks. about uh, <laughs> how the coaches are getting the wrong players out there. Bill, any tactical changes you see coming? No? I'm not telling Nothing you. you're telling me? <laughs> but I can tell you that we, there's, in the last two years, we, three, yep. we found, that were so simple that if I told you, you guys would laugh and say, oh my God, how is it that, now, it could very well be that other teams are doing it as well. Yeah. Or have been doing it for some time and we're the dummies. But we came up, we were three that were so, so easy, <laughs> it's like, well, it, it wouldn't be a Sloan hockey panel without the point at which someone says, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny, what do you have? Um, you know, I, I have to say, as a, even though I'm the analytics person, I, I kind of, my prior is sort of that coaches are really, really good at tactics. Right. And they're really, really good tactically. And it's, it seems not particularly likely to me that we're going to get this data and say, oh my God, you guys were idiots all along. It seems really, really unlikely to me. I think there for sure will be things that will say, oh, here are some tweaks we can make and here are maybe some things that we can rethink. Yeah. Um, I don't believe that as analysts we should go into it thinking, let's try to reinvent the wheel. I think it'd be foolish to sort of ignore all this, you know, years and years and years worth of heavily vetted prior information. I mean, these coaches have been coaching their whole life. This information has been passed down for a really long period of time. It's, it's robust in a lot of ways. See, I agree with you, except I'm going to throw a counter argument at you, which is that if you look at baseball, it's changed dramatically. Like they're shifting all over the place. Everybody just swings to the fences. It's not necessarily an attractive change for people watching the sport, but the game has shifted dramatically in terms of how it's played. And I think it seems to be generally conceded that a lot of these changes are, pardon me, changes driven by data. And, and, you know, so if the coaches had been getting it right 10, 15, 20 years ago, I don't know that we necessarily would have seen the sport transformed to the extent that we have. So that's baseball. Basketball, uh, Kirk Goldsbury, who I'm sure is rattling around this conference somewhere, has a great chart out on Twitter right now about his new book. Um, it's called Sprawl Ball. I'll promote it up here. And but you should go look at his Twitter because the beautiful thing is it shows how the, NA, the NBA shot location has changed from like 2002 versus today. And in 2002, it's all sorts of mid-range jumpers. Yeah. And now it's in the paint outside the three-point line. So why are hockey coaches so special that they've been getting it right Whereas baseball and basketball, you know, managers and coaches had so much they could learn. It's a fair question. I'm going to interrupt you. I can tell you that the three instances that I referenced yeah. were all coach provoked. Right. Based on interaction with the analytics guys, what about this? Right. Can we, and then the results came back. Aha. Uh -huh. So well, actually, you it know what, may very I'm, well be to Sonny's point that, that the coaches were getting it right. Or they had the right idea, but they needed mm -hmm. the data yep. to, you know, they, they could go to the data people and say, does this make sense? Correct. Like that was something that I, you know, I agree with you. I used but it, to work. It, was, it was the existence of, of the analytics entity that allowed them to even get their brains to walk down the path. Right, say, right. What if, what right. could it be? Yeah, I would, I would just say, Tyler, I mean, it's totally a fair counterpoint, and I could very well be wrong. Um, I think hockey's different. I think the role of coaching is completely different 
um, in hockey than it is in baseball. Right. Baseball is fundamentally a one-on-one -on -one sport. It's a pitcher versus batter. And yes, these tactics of where to place fielders and how to approach a pitcher as a hitter, those things matter, but it's, it's very, very different than coordinating uh, 12 people on the ice at the same time in various zones. I mean, the, the, I think we can all agree, I mean, the coach is actively involved so much more heavily in hockey than they are in baseball. Sure, uh, sure. Like, like in hockey, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I agree with that. And in terms of getting the matchups, which is the ongoing battle throughout yeah. the game. All right, we'll take a few audience questions now. So if you have any others, make sure you tweet them at Sam, who I think is here somewhere. Um, so this is for everyone. And I guess particularly I'm interested, well, everyone. What do you think is the biggest factor that the online or public hockey analytics community overlooks or is missing when it comes to player evaluation? Domain knowledge. Predictive value and domain knowledge. And so when you say domain knowledge, you mean like sort of knowing about hockey? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, it's, I mean, I don't, yeah. I, I, that's, I know, you kind of put it harshly. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't mean I, I know, I did the old lawyer trick of putting some out. words in your mouth. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, like, I don't believe that hockey is an area where you can take a whole bunch of big data and run a whole bunch of regressions and, and look for correlations everywhere and try to solve the game. Um, I'm suspicious that that works in other businesses, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> if, if you would accept that it may, yeah. You know, this is not like looking at 10 million rows of customer churn data for a telephone company. Right. You know, this is, um, to me, the scientific method starts with hypothesis first. You have to understand the game. You have to understand why the things you're seeing are the way they are. Because the results we're seeing are not, you know, independent. They're not independently distributed. They're biased. And you have to figure out why they're biased. You have to understand the game. So to me, it starts from that perspective. And I think that hockey analysts, at times, um, I've seen, it, not even just in hockey, I think in, in all s statistics, in a lot of statistical realms, you're seeing um, more focus on big data, big data, and less focus on thinking about the domain itself. Now, having said that, I think a fair criticism on the opposite front, like there's a lot of front offices in hockey that I think probably have lots of domain knowledge and maybe aren't using it probabilistically, translating it correctly, which I think analytics can be helpful for. So for you then, it sounds like, you know, a, a big thing if you're, you know, here and you're 22 and you want to be an analytics person, um, you need to, you know, domain knowledge should be what you're worried about acquiring, like learning about the game and then really bringing that thinking into what you're doing with the tools, uh, analytics, data science tools you have. Yes, that, and yeah. then using it to try to make predictions and see how good you are. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. No, I think that's, uh, that's an excellent point. Bill, as a former agent and now uh, assistant GM, or associate GM, pardon me, how much, if any, do advanced stats play a role in negotiations? Well, uh, <laughs> no, they, they play a role in the, in the credibility side. So when you're speaking to an agent, and it's somebody for whom you have respect, and you're trying legitimately to come to a fair value. You have arbitration-based numbers, and, and we can all get pretty close. Yeah. So if a player has arbitration, we, a well-intentioned agent and, and our, our group can get, we know what the number's going to be. Yeah. Um, but if you're really trying to give some value and listen and hear them, then it plays a role. And, right. and, it's, and it's sincere, and it's real, and you want to treat the players fairly. We only have so much money to split up. Right. So sometimes you have to pull the reins back. I just, I need to, I need to limit how much I can pay. But at the same time, you want to respect and, 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 and validate the player. Because a lot of times, you know, the numbers don't lie. So right. They can play a role. Um, and just to clarify your point on arbitration, you mean that once a player is arbitration eligible, the advanced stats are almost irrelevant because what matters is what's he going to get in arbitration. Correct. That, yeah, okay. Correct. There's, a certain, there's certain stats that are uh, admissible into arbitration, yes. and that's going to define what the award is. And you look back over time, you see the precedent, you see what other players are getting or have been awarded, similarly situated players, and you're going to narrow the field. You're going to have comparable players with similar stats, and you'll be able to frame what that award's going to be well, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. but, but you, you can come pretty close. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Megan, uh, as a player, um, and I think you're taking a year off this year, um, but what is the highest priority thing you'd like to see you know, uh, brought into the women's league? Like, like you know, what, what do you think would be cool or, or fun to have access to uh, as a player? 
Oof, that's a loaded question. Um, <clears throat> geez. I guess, um, well, I think more data on the goalie pulling thing would yeah. be huge, yeah. one. Um, but I, I mean, I think things, you know, they've been implementing in the NHL, I, I think, for a long time, but just, you know, high percentage scoring areas yeah. um, would be something that I would love to see the data on. You know, we see small things um, that I think independent people do just by, you know, watching the game and then sending them to our team through social media. But, you know, little things where all the shots are that you're scoring on over an entire tournament or over an entire year, things like that uh, in the women's game, at least at our level, you know, we don't have access to, we never see. So when I do see, you know, intermittent kind of low end versions of them, um, I find that they'd be helpful for us. So sure. um, just, you know, high percentage scoring areas. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, uh, no, I think that's a good one. And that's always uh, interesting when you see that and you can start to sort of see the game visually a little more than, than you have in the past. Uh, all right, Chris, I guess a question I have for you, and you know what, Bill and Sonny might have thoughts too. And actually, Megan, maybe you will, maybe everyone will. <laughs> Some of you guys might have thoughts. Uh, <laughs> will shift usage change as new data becomes available? Like, are we going to see coaches change how much they're using their star players, whether it's more or less? Uh, do you think that the data that's going to become available will bear on that? I think the data will have an impact. I just don't know how quickly that, that changeover will happen. But yeah, I definitely think there's going to be data that's going to have an impact on player usage. Length of shifts, uh, length of shifts, that'd probably be the primary thing that to be looked at first. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank our panel. I know everyone came from some distance to be here, and I'm happy for that. And I want to thank all of you for coming in and listening today.